Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the next uh, lecture in the Society series on architectural styles. I'm Peter Ruback. I'm chairman of the 20th Century Society. As most of you know, we're the national organization that campaigns to protect the best post-1914 architecture and design. We're a member organization and we're a charity. Um, and you can find out more about us on the Society's website, www.c20society.org.uk, including how we actually go about doing the campaigning and the protection. Um, it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce Geraint Franklin from Historic England. Geraint is a, an architectural historian. He was involved in two thematic reviews. That's the process by which whole areas of building types are looked at and considered for listing and hence enhanced protection for commercial architecture, that's commercial offices, and uh, most recently on postmodern buildings, uh, which is what we're going to hear about tonight. He's the author of a monograph for the Society on Howell, Killick, Partridge and Amis, and he's written extensively on postmodernism, not least with Elaine Harwood, uh, in their book for the Society in the last couple of years. And finally, he's the author of a book on Ramsgate, uh, which was published this year by uh, Historic England. It's my great pleasure to introduce Geraint, who's going to talk to us about postmodernism. Geraint. Thanks, Peter. So, uh, before I start, I'm just going to say that um, at the end, we'll take some questions. So, if you've got any questions, if you'd like to type them in your chat bar and I'll um, have a look at them um, at the end and do it that way. Okay, so without further ado, I will launch my slides. Okay, um, hoping you can all see those and hear me. So postmodernism, uh, when it comes to architecture, postmodernism is a deliberately elusive term. Is it a stylistic label? Uh, is it a movement of like-minded protagonists? Or is it, uh, heaven help us, a philosophical concept like brutalism, which we heard in a previous uh, lecture, the meaning of the term has only become more layered, complex and misconstrued over time. It would be fairly postmodernist to say that there are many postmodernisms and each of us should probably pick the one that works best for ourselves. So let's dive in with a selection of projects showing not the corporate version of postmodernism, but its contingent makeshift ephemeral side which i think is the most potential to be thoughtful or even radical so here we go phillips west 2 in west london here's its architect piers goff quote when we were doing the scheme the planners looked at the drawings and thought it was frank lloyd wright we had in mind Therefore, they insisted that it should be painted brown or maroon. So we did it pink. It's still pink. People like it pink. Well, unfortunately, it's not pink anymore. Um, and as you can see from the sequence of sli slides, which is a kind of pr ongoing process of gentrification, at the top left is the original state of these warehouses. Top right, uh, CZWG's process of loading up painting pink, strapping on ironwork, uh, and various accretions, sort of bay windows. And, and there's Elaine's photograph, uh, bottom right of its presence, it being painted a tasteful farrow and ball, sort of ash gray, and it's lost some of its accretions. Um, so rather, rather too tasteful for, for, for us tonight. Um, here's uh, Terry Farrell, another big postmodernist in this country, um, uh, in Covent Garden with his pavilion for Clifton nurse, Nurseries. And here's a quote from um, contemporary um, architect Charles Holland. Um, he says, 
In a moment of admirable chutzpah, Farrell placed Clifton Nurseries directly on access within Ego Jones St Paul's. Not only that, but the new building's facade directly echoed the temple front of Jones's church, albeit sliced down the middle, so that only, only half its implied width was inhabited. Behind this billboard front lurked a monopit structure covered only by a high-tech tensile roof. A mix of solid and void Doric columns supported the portico with an Art Deco style rising sun fenestration pattern. Unquote. You can just see from these festoons of live swags. Here's John Utram, um, who in his project for harp heating in Swanley and Kent, sadly uh, no more. And he said in, a, in, a, in an interview for the British Library, quote, up to then my design language had been pretty abstract, fairly restrained. Harp heating had strange coloured capitals, which were like flames. At the back of my mind was a sort of joke about gas jets. The plumbers used to come in to buy supplies. One said to me, Ooh, it's quite Art Deco, isn't it? The client was worried what his bank manager would make of the coloured capitals. Next, we have the, the modernist uh, and former partner of James Sterling, James Gowan, um, making a, a temporary bookshop at the Royal Coll College of Art, where he taught. Uh, and he wrote, the shop presents a variant of the Palladian motif adapted to serve as an entrance doorway in a pair of display windows. The giant order has been transposed to the right and left of the facade and attached columns have lowered capitals. So the shaft pops out above. Egyptian number three fashion, if Owen Jones is to be the guide. When I asked the contractor how these prefabricated columns would fit between the existing floor and ceiling, he explained that the top piece was telescopic, so perhaps a fifth order had been invented. And lastly, another late lamented building, the home base on Warwick Road in Kensington by the unqualified non-architect Ian Pollard of Flaxyard uh, for Lord Sainsbury, whose family owned, of course, the home base chain. Astrigal, uh, the architect's journal, reported in 1988 of modifications taking place um, on the building site. Apparently the modifications are taking place because Sir John Sainsbury happened to be driving past the building and was somewhat taken back when he realised that this odd collection of historical bits bore his name. It is, however, not clear if this horror was the result of a violent reaction against postmodernism brought about by his experiences over Ben Churi's National Gallery design, or simply realisation that the ill-defined image of home base would not be helped if this historicist extravaganza was completed in the same month as Nick Grimshaw's high-tech home base on the Great West Road. And finally, James Sterling, um, with on the left his full-scale model incorporating parts of his Staats, Staats Gallery in Stuttgart at the Foster Rogers Sterling um, exhibition at the Royal Academy in 1986. After the exhibition it was purchased by Charles Jenks and re-erected re with additions by Jenks at his estate in Portrack where it can be viewed um, on open garden events. Um, so sort of multiple layers of postmodernism um, in, in sort of in, in, in the building's follification. So let's try and look at some characteristics of these buildings and indeed postmodernism at large. None of these are exclusive to postmodernism, but together they seem to add up to something with its own unique identity. So I think inherent to the idea of postmodernism is a diversity, a plurality, a hybridity. Um, in the words of uh, Robert Venturi, who wrote um, a manifesto for postmodernism in 1965, uh, com complexity and contradiction in architecture, it's about both 
and and not either or so it's having its cake and eating it it's very much about engaging with context with setting with the site with the urban surroundings and also with, with history with architectural history it's about communicating to users of the building its inhabitants the the wider public through signs and symbols one can communicate multiple things at a single time or better still different things to different people so it's about multiple coding as charles jenks one of uh, the, the the main theorist and popularizers of postmodern modernism put it um, jenks was very much interested with what he termed taste cultures popular um, visual codes and the way in which they could be um, alluded through to through um, sort of uh, signs and symbols and largely uh, it's about um, the relationship with um, modernity and with modernism in Jenks's formulation postmodernism is one part modern one part something else and I think that's a pretty good formula so let's just amplify this last, last point which is which i think is key because the clue is in the name postmodern it all comes down to postmodernism's relationship with modernism now in conventional accounts that relationship is presented as um, a reaction um, we have a crisis in architecture in the 1970s, a loss of faith in the modern movement, and particularly what it did to our towns and cities. Out of this, the prevailing account goes, emerges a new attitude. It's, if you like, the Oedipal myth of postmodernism. Well, that's all very well, but what I want to suggest is a different relationship with modernism one that stresses their relatedness, their shared DNA. After all, postmodernism uses the same building technology as modernism, and many of its many of the same planning techniques. Like modernism, POMO occurs across all the arts, with particularly strong links to design. And like modernism, it's an international language with significant regional variations or dialects. So perhaps postmodernism and modernism are a duality with each needing the other to define itself. Colin Rowe wrote of postmodernism as another tradition of modernity in contradistinction to the supposed mainline of Gropier, Meyer, Marinetti a counter formulation represented by such as Stravinsky, Joyce, Picasso, Eliot and Proust. It embraces metaphor, irony and multiple meaning. There's a lot to unpack there but I think this gets us somewhere. It relates postmodernism to the more permissive, liberated or extrovert strands of the pre-war avant-garde. The radical outliers that in terms of architecture were discarded in the rush to codify the modern movement and obtain state patronage. So, Lebetkin's penthouse at High Point too could be claimed as proto-pomo, as could Edward James' transformation of Lutchens's Moncton House or even the Baroque fireplace and grass carpet of Carlos de Bestigui's apartment on the Champs-Élysées, designed by, another, by none other than Le, Le Cabusier, who was, after all, in, in touch with his subconscious. One of the themes of this talk is the position of postmodernism in British architectural culture. The 1980s is sometimes depicted as one long culture war, between modernists and traditionalists, with postmodernists depicted somewhat awkwardly in between. But what's remarkable is the degree to which all of these various interests were vying 
and mixing and cross-fertilizing. Louis Hellman brilliantly sends up a set of interchangeable clip-on styles. In Alan's talk uh, on Neo Geo, another rhyming style, I was impressed with his Venn diagram, and I thought I'd do one for the 1980s. Well, it's all a bit crude. When you look at the overlapping edges of styles rather than the centers, it all seems a lot more fluid. And, and one is struck by how richly populated the interstices and crossroads are. This implies a measure of cultural tolerism on which we might look well look back with envy. Some architects, it seems, freely traversed across boundaries according to their needs. Others made transgressive raids. But let's look at some of these edge conditions. What do you get when you cross Pomo with high tech? Well, um, one could say that it all starts with James Sterling's building for Olivetti, mixing um, sort of GRP clip-on elements with skewed axes and a relationship um, with an existing uh, historic building. We have Terry Farrell, the man who in Day, Day and Sujik's phrase, who took high tech out to play. Well, of course we get Terry Farrell's um, famous egg cup finials at, um, at the TBAM building in Camden. What I'd like to, you to look at here is the building uh, above it, which was for um, Thames Water, contemporaneous with TVAM, but a lot less well known. And it's one of those buildings which uh, was apportioned in the sort of messy divorce uh, that Farrell had with Grimshaw at the end of their partnership at the end of the 80s. And this one went to Terry Farrell. So it's a marvellous kind of melange of high tech uh, with aspects, with elements of, uh, of POMO, very much um, united stateside. Homo. And in um, Tim Britton Caitlin's phrase, it's Terry Farrell's um, kind of um, uh, kind of um, swimming pool kind of style. Of course, we have when it comes to um, high tech, we have the more fruity aspect of high tech. Um, um, with the sort of invariable, inev inevitable tributes to the Crystal Palace. And finally, the unclassifiable, um, his Rodney Gordon, St. James Street. Uh, Rodney Gordon, of course, best known um, for his work for Owen Luder, um, um, but here sort of pulling off um, a strange mixture of high tech and, uh, and some strange uh, postmodernism. So, what about neo-vernacular? Um, we have Hillingdon, hailed by Andrew Saint, as one of the first buildings to depart from the modern movement. All the more surprisingly by Andrew Derbyshire, the mastermind behind uh, Rumjum's York University, a, a masterpiece of prefabrication. Derbyshire later explained that the councillors that were his, his client representatives, th this is a civic centre um, for the London borough of Hillingdon after local government reorganisation in 1974, his councillors were suburbanites and they asked, if it can't be detached, then at least can it be semi-detached with some greenery, brick walls and a pitch tile roof? The architects rediscovered a lot about design that they'd been taught to forget picking up brick and tile detailing from driving around the native Hertfordshire. We have the contemporaneous Ealing Shopping Centre. Local resident Louis Hellman commented, architecturally, the scheme is confused. Its elements vary from excellent to poor, but then that description also fits its inspirational Edwardian Ealing. And not far away, uh, St Mark's Road housing by Jeremy F and Fenella uh, Dixon, dipping into the London vernacular, but also borrowing from 
um, to style and, and crow's depth gables. Rather more sty stylish variant, perhaps drawing upon James Sterling's work. Uh, and, and this is a late piece of, of council housing by the Architects Department of the London Borough of Islington. And what, what are the overlaps with classical revival? Well, this has a lot to do with Leon Creer, uh, best known now as um, Prince Charles's architectural advisor and the master planner of Pan. This is his scheme for Roma Interrotta, a project which we'll look um, at in more detail later. Uh, very different is Pelopar House in the City of London for the Skinner's Company, um, a composition of superimposed Doric columns, twisted colonnettes in, in metal and flaming urns. We have Henley Royal Regatta, a, com, um, a temple cum boatshed emerging from a rusticated river wall and perhaps Terry Farrell's most classical um, work. And the Beaux-Arts high-tech of Arab Associates um, at Tadworth uh, Legal and General House, one of their, um, one of their, their um, more postmodern works. We have John Utram um, at the uh, the Orangery at the newly listed New House at Wadhurst for the Rousings. Um, this is um, a late 19th century Gothic um, conservatory or Orangery, which um, he sort of adds uh, a new interior skin to inside, and later um, adds a sort of Buckminster Fuller style roof. What are the crossovers with sort of soft modernism, or as it was termed in the, in the architectural review, romantic pragmatism? So coming into this category, we have Richard, Richard McCormack's works at Oxbridge, um, looking here at St. John's College, Oxford. One could also look at Worcester College, the Sainsbury building. We have Ted Cullinan here, um, playing sort of merry games with, with um, Alice in Wonderland-like elements at his RMC house, uh, which was listed a few years back. We have the Hampshire Architects Department under Colin Stansfield-Smith, combining respect for setting and the vernacular with a knowing wit and bold geometric shapes. Now, of course, there were international cross currents. Uh, we have um, global networks such as the Architectural Association and its teachers. We have international exhibitions such as the 1980 Venice Biennale. We have figures such as Charles Jenks or Leon Creer who made Britain their second home. And there were Brits who influenced postmodernism through their teaching positions in the United States, such as Colin Rowe or Alan Cahoon. It would be, and of course, Robin Middleton. It would be possible to show a selection of British buildings that emphasizes their affinities with the work of Venturi and Scott Brown, Michael Graves, Charles Moore, Aldo Rossi, Hans Holine, Paolo Portoghese, Mario Botta, and the rest. But rather, I'd like to stay with the British scene and unpack the distinctive character and identity of postmodernism in Britain. So I'd like to look at um, a number of characteristic characteristics of four groups of essential qualities. And the first quality I'd like to flag up is contextualism, or if you like, place. The conservation movement um, 
and heritage protection legislation helped to bring about a heightened awareness of and response to the historic city. And from the mid 1960s onwards, the words context and environment start to crop up in an architect in an architectural context. The 1970 Derby competition entry by James Sterling with Leon Creer is an early suggestion of how the immediate urban situation could provoke a bold counter response which marshalled juxtaposition and montage. Derby and other contemporary Sterling projects such as his unbuilt 1971 proposal for an arts centre for St Andrews University in Edinburgh nicely anticipate Colin Rowe's Collage City, which made the argument for an urban design based on fragmentation, bricolage, and a variety of meanings to secure visual and economic diversity. Colin Rowe's um, Sterling went on to contribute to the 1978 Roma Interrotta exhibition, in which a dozen architects were invited to submit their interpretation of sections of the, of the 1748 Noli Plan of Rome. So um, here's uh, Jim Sterling collaging his different projects, built and unbuilt, and mark, there's various marks if you can identify any of these projects. And what he's doing is incorporating them into the fabric of 18th century Rome. We have Terry Farrell, the urbanist. Um, here he is at Covent Garden, um, newly saved from the GLC, um, knitting together listed, newly listed buildings um, at seven dials and around with strategic interventions. Um, of his own. And those, those works were in turn listed by Historic England um, recently as part of the thematic project on postmodernism. Terry Farrell went on to produce a counter proposal for Mansion House Square, which had su seen successive um, schemes by Mies van der Rohe and uh, James Sterling, both commissioned by Lord Palumbo. But here's Terry, Terry Farrell suggesting that the existing and listed 19th century buildings on the site could be retained with again strategic connections and routes through um, sort of um, knitting together these various parts of the city. It, it's a really fascinating um, sort of bit of, of, of a London that could have been. And lastly, here's a reminder that contextualism isn't about sort of agreement, uh, it can also uh, be about juxtaposition, contrast, shock. This is set CZWG um, at London's Docklands, inserting a new a London grand point in, in the middle of streets and very much um, ramping up the contrast with this kind of Yves Klein blue. My second characteristic and it's again by no means exclusive to POMO, is the pictorial composition approach, best known in this country as townscape, but descending from the picturesque movement of the 18th century and the urbanism of the 19th century Austrian architect Camillo Sitte. So this is where all those um, urban figure ground diagrams in black and white come from. And this is really about the unfolding of a spatial sequence from a moving viewpoint. It's a bit like the long tracking shots that you get in a Kubrick film. It's an aesthetic which is mediated through the experience of the pedestrian or the inhabitant. Richard Reed acknowledges the, inf the influence of uh, Camille Cité on his epic, Epping Civic Centre um, of 1985 to 90. So it's another London, outer London civic centre. This time entered underneath the tower and you go into a high narrow atrium um, or through a grand ceremonial stair into the horseshoe shaped council chamber that you can see projecting 
projecting into the street. Another ingenious entrance sequence can be found in James Sterling's Claw Gallery at Tate Britain, where the visitor is taken through a sequence of foyer, thin narrow stairwell, mezzanine and walkway, perhaps an indoor equivalent of the architectural promenade of Sterling's Stuttgart Staats Gallery. And we get a kind of mythological version of townscape um, in the work of John Utrum, who analysed the landscape paintings of Claude Lorraine to obtain a narrative sequence describing the course of a river within a valley. Uh, so you get a sequence of cave, bridge, ruin, delta, and so on. And these provide Utrum with an iconographical scheme which recurs in many of his projects as a structuring device. You can see here in this proposal for Bracken House, the FT's headquarters, the, the sort of cascading waterfall that, um, that sort of cascades down uh, the building. My third characteristic is the arts and crafts tradition from which British Pomo inherits a sense of material, materiality and the vernacular. At Founders Hall, the heritage of a city guild of metal workers is reflected in the predominance of bespoke metal fittings and the incorporation of elements from the company's previous library halls. The partner in charge, Sam Lloyd, was a third generation of the arts and crafts practice founded by his grandfather, W. Curtis Green in 1898. We have the stocky brick finishes of William Whitfield's projects. A similar chunky, solid characteristic in John Utrum's work. And the, the um, an arts and crafts sensibility in the work of Alan Short. And of course, the thread is brought up to date with a house for Essex in Radness, North Essex, uh, and a, a collaboration between fashion, architecture, taste, and the artist and ceramicist Grayson Perry, exploring the narrative potential of the arts and crafts tradition. My fourth characteristic is the links between architectural history and stylistic revivals. Some of English Pomo has a learned quality which owes much to a scholarly revival of interest in architectural history. So Cahoul and Miller's take on Palladio via Joseph Hoffman, although I'm sure that neither of them would have uh, thanked being called, being called postmodernists. There was a special interest in the Victorian, Edwardian and interwar periods. They represented the front line of the conservation movement. Figures marginalized in modernist historiography such as Charles Rennie Mackintosh and Edwin Lutyens were rehabilitated in the 1960s, along with similarly discredited movements such as Art Deco, the subject of a 1966 study by Bevis Hillier and the Vienna Secession. Publication of these architects and styles had a strong influence on British Pomo. A Mackintosh revival was sustained by the restoration of several buildings and the incorporation of interiors from 78 South Park Avenue, Glasgow, into the Hunterian Museum and Gallery Extension by William Whitfield, which opened in 1981. The Macintosh influence was huge and took a variety of forms, the more superficial described by Gavin Stamp as Mockintosh. Lutchins was the subject of a 1981 exhibition at the Hayward Gallery designed by Piers Goff as of CZWG. While the influence of his Marsh Court, Court and Page Street flats, along with the Edwardian verticalism of Charles Holden, is evident on John Mercer's, John Melvin, sorry, Mercer's House of 1991 to two. In the city, this work by Dick Dickinson of the Rolf Judd Group for the Giro Centrale Vienna Bank, 
aptly incorporates Vienna Secession reference, references. And he wasn't alone. Terry Farrell went through an Otto Wagner phase, while Piers Goff discovered Hector Guimard, Victor Orta, Michel de Klerk, and Hans Polzig. Many of these names were brigaded by Pevsner in a 1966 talk on anti-pioneers, a kind of counterthesis to his 1936 text, Pioneers of the Modern Movement, in which he noted the cul culpability of historians in stylistic revivals, and ultimately what he termed a postmodernist style. Remember, he's writing in 1966. But excessive historicism could also stifle originality. Piers Goff said, I despise this raiding of history. I despise it, but it's, it's all we can do. So what was the legacy of post minority influence Howard, that um, postmodernism arguably finished too soon? It was highly reactive and perhaps a bit like an unstable isotope, isotope, keen to combine with other elements, but tarnishing rapidly on exposure. Yet it has characteristics which keep on bringing people back to it. It was underpinned, after all, by a rich body of theory. And that perhaps is something to do with its recurring attractiveness to younger generations. Let, let's have a look at some more or less contemporary uh, projects, well, of the last 15 years or so, which draw upon some of these, these ideas. Um, although, again, their practitioners might not label themselves postmodernist. The Hypercourse Pavilion by Muff Architecture an art drawing upon the uh, second century Roman mosaic within to produce this marvellous textured concrete skin, uh, textured with um, shells, like sort of oyster shells that were found in the exhibition, the, the excavation on the site, um, much used by the Romans, and um, cut out with this geometrical geometric motif. We have the green in Nunhead, a community building, which draws upon the sort of brick nogging of the interwar pub next to it, but of course inevitably references Venturi's Vanna Venturi house. We have the Lomax studio, one of many buildings which somehow manages to um, bring back an atmosphere of postmodernism without quoting any particular building. Something similar going on um, in this, um, this uh, scheme of uh, works and alterations to a 1970 Neo-Georgian terraced house in Islington in Canterbury, um, channeling something of, of a kind of neo-rationalism of the 1970 and this combination of stack bond and sort of very bare uh, round-headed arches with terrazzo aplenty. Uh, also bang up to date is this intervention in late and high road by Camille Wallala, the so-called Wallala parade and it brings me to the question have we reached peak homo well, perhaps for tonight we have, but I'd like to end um, with perhaps a wider point, which is that um, it's not about a Pomo revival necessary, necessarily. The, the legacy of postmodernism in this country is arguably that it helped to make um, architecture in Britain a more tolerant, permissive space. Um, it helped to set the stage for the gestural and iconic preoccupations of a later generation. And I think I'll end there and we can perhaps um, take some questions.
So at this point, um, if you've got any questions or thoughts, do type them in, as I say, the, the Q&A in the sort of chat bar and um, I'll, I'll pick them up. So from Andrew Jackson, got, I've always thought of Hellman's over detailed pseudo community style as a poor man's pomo. Given how postmodernism draws upon a number of other styles, does it have boundaries and when does a building cease to be pomo? Well, I suppose um, that's, that's what I was trying to explore with my, with my bubble diagram. Um, I do think, I don't know if you can read um, the, the captions. I'll just share the screen again. I don't know if you can read the captions in um, the Hellman cartoon. Um, where are we? So we have um, the raw, sort of um, anti-clockwise from top, top uh, left, the raw unpackaged material, um, over-detailed pseudo-community. There's something of uh, Edward Ted Cullen in that, I think. Um, neoclassicism by numbers, reproduction. I think that's having a bit of a knock at, knock at Cullen and, and, and co. Um, Boring money lenders mod with plastic frills added. Well, that must be um, Marco Polo House, another building by Ian Pollard. Um, top right, mock heritage vernacular. Uh, obviously, talking about all the kind of Neo Geo, Asda's, and, 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 and supermarkets, uh, and so on. Noddy Lego Pomo. There's a bit of uh, James Sterling there, I can see. Um, silly yuppie morphic postmodern, which I think is delightful. That, that's. Um, CZWG's um, uh, various buildings, including Janet Street, Janet Street Porter House and the uh, Phillips West too, and then late high tech brutalist revival, which uh, I think these are brilliant. But these these overlaps, I think, between between the styles are, are key, um, uh, uh, and I think uh, things were a lot more fluid than than later histories perhaps have made them out to be. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, Heather Hall. Um, oh, hang on. Uh, da -da -da -da. So I'm just having a look at these questions. Um, There appears to be a fair amount of German references and influence. Where did this come from? Um, it's a good question. Well, um, I suppose it might come from German architectural historical uh, historical approaches uh, by, or alternatively, um, from Sterling's work in Germany. Um, I don't know. I mean, um, you have people like um, Hans Hollein um, uh, and, and others active in Germany and Austria. Uh, John Burns, do we feel we're still in a postmodern era? And if so, are contemporary architects too embarrassed of the idea of decoration and anything more than subtle historic references? Is postmodern not just not fashionable anymore? Well, uh, I, I think um, we over the last 10 years we we've seen quite an interesting cycle I and mean, it's often said that a building goes through a an, a sort of unhappy valley where after, where the first after the first 10 15 years um it, it falls out of fashion it gets slated then it's rediscovered by a younger generation um and um that happened arguably after the vna's um postmodern Postmodernism exhibition in 2011. Uh, a lot happened. There was a lot of books. We did a listing project um, in 2015, um, and alongside that, as Pevsner remarked in the 1970s, you get this very sort of um, uh, kind of slightly um, this 
a reciprocal relationship between historians and revivalist architects. So uh, I tried to pick up some of those works at the end. I feel that this, the fashion cycle has again somewhat come to an end if remarks on Twitter are, are in anything to go by. So I think it's time for perhaps the uh, metabolist revival or the uh, high tech revival. Perhaps deconstructivism will be next. Sebastian Wormel, um, do I think there are any truly great POMO buildings would, would I select as having enduring architectural quality? Well, for that, I would refer you to our, our listing project. And I wrote an article on called in, in um, the Cambridge Journal ARQ, Architectural Research Quarterly, on listing uh, postmodernism. And in, in the back of that, uh, there's a sort of um, compendium of all of the works that we listed, um, uh, of which the most recent is, is John Utram's Wadhurst, um, the new house. So I, I would suggest that that's a particularly enduring um, classic building, which will be uh, more and more appreciated um, as, it, as, it ages, as it ages. And the other great thing about that building is that Utram was called back by his clients to design several later phases. So it's the buildings, you walk around it, it's a sort of catalogue of the, of the architect's development. Right. Um, any more for any more? I think we have David Phillips. How are the needs of sustainable buildings with a small ecological footprint shaping design? Well, in uh, the post postmodern context, I point there to the work of Alan Short, who um, is doing a huge amount, particularly in, in university design, um, with high high um, levels of insulation, stack ventilation, and so on, and um, also the work of, of Bed Z. Um, it may not be POMO, but uh, sort of doing a lot with um, ecological design and trying to obtain sort of a gestural architecture from it. So um, for more on those buildings, you might want to consult a certain book. Um, and we have John Utrum. I don't know who John Utrum is, um, but he he's saying Giovanni Muzio was, I think, pre-war. And what about Milanese New Liberty? That was going strong before Venturi, who was both modern as well as very open to history. The Italians, trust the Italians to do things first. Well, John, uh, I think, I think you, you've put it in one there. I, I think it was the, it was the Milanese neo-libertarians who particularly got Petner's goat and, and that of Raymond Bannum as well. There's some absolutely astonishing buildings which you must have known um, in, in, in the 1950s and, and which of course Venturi in his uh, complexity and contradiction uh, refers to. So yes indeed things start in Italy and they continue all the way through with people like Zotzas. I think that's a good way, a good point with, with that contribution to from one of our the, the, the protagonists of postmodernism. I think we can bring things to a close there. So thank you very much for attending and um, goodbye. Right. Thank you, Geraint. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, if you've enjoyed the lecture this evening um, uh, and you're not a member of the society, please join. You can do it on our website. If you are a member and you've enjoyed the lecture, if you'd like to make a donation, we'd be very grateful. And before we go, just to say uh, next week, it will be Geraint again in conversation with John Utram. So very much a follow on from this evening's uh, very interesting lecture. Thank you, every, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Geraint. Thank you.